let's all learn from my mistakes, shall we? Ahoy v'shikni. I mean, ahoy v'shem. V'shikni? We'll get into that one in a minute. Like any foreigner trying to acclimate to a new culture, I sometimes make mistakes. One of the best things about making these videos about Czech people and about their country is the immediate feedback I get from Czech people when I get something wrong. So today we're gonna take a deep dive into my comment section. It's not that bad. And even if you haven't seen these videos yet, you're definitely gonna learn a few very useful things about the Czech Republic in today's video, I promise. In my Kralovets video, which was like the most fun video to make, I really prided myself on the background imagery I created. I mean, come on, an animated fish tank? A taxidermied nutria? A portrait of Putin riding a bear. Does it seem to you like I overlook details? Yeah, so apparently I hung the Czech flag backwards. Let me take a minute to let you all behind the curtain of making a video. So these videos take a lot of time and I put a lot of creative energy into them. And sometimes, often, I'm working up until the very last moment before the video goes live. We're talking Wednesday at 5.45 p.m. It's like I'm a painter who's hanging my paintings that are still wet on the walls of a gallery, and then 10 minutes later, I open the doors, and immediately there are hundreds of people just giving me reviews of my work. It can get emotionally taxing. And Kralovets was one of these videos that took a lot of work. And then within minutes of hanging my proverbial painting on the gallery wall, I see the comments. The flag is backwards. And it just made me want to cut off my ear. So. Truthfully, I am very grateful for everyone who did point out the backwards flag because for the rest of my life, I will never hang the Czech flag the wrong way again. One viewer, Tomasz Vodička, even took the time to send me a diagram and sent me a little mnemonic to help me remember. So when the flag is hung horizontally, the white or bila is on top and the red or červená is on the bottom. So B before C. It's the same when hanging the Czech flag on its side. From left to right, as if you're reading, B comes before C or Ch. Thank you, Tomasz, and everyone else who pointed out the error. Also, I want to send my heartfelt appreciation to commenter Jan, who was like, I loved how the vertical flag was the wrong way around. Jen knows that, of course, but Kralovets didn't yet. You, sir, are my favorite fan. In my Winner Idioms video, I mentioned these classic photographs from, you know, almost a century ago of people ice skating on the Vltava River here in Prague. And although it gets very cold here in winter, I've never seen remotely enough ice to support ice skating. So in the video, I offhandedly remarked that this was due to today's climate. But many of you pointed out that the lack of ice was not due to climate change, but it was actually due to the Vltava Cascade, which is a series of dams along the river. The temperature in the Prague portion of the Vltava is now warmer than it used to be, particularly because of one dam about 30 kilometers from Prague in Sloppy, built in the 1950s. Water in the dam is about four degrees Celsius. So by the time the water gets to Prague, it doesn't have enough time to cool down enough to freeze to ice skating temperatures. In this video, where I explained the Czech presidential election and how it was different from the American system, I said, now I am 99% sure that Czechs can't vote at all by mail even if they're vacationing in another part of the country that day or just can't make it to the polls for some reason. Which was true. Many pointed out that it's written in the Czech constitution that votes must be secret and there's no way to guarantee secrecy by mail. But many of you told me that you can apply for a voter ID, which you have to do in advance, but then you can take that voter ID card to any polling station in the country, not just your local station. And from there, you can vote. 
I also mentioned that when Zaman had been sick, he had been able to vote from home. And I wondered if this was something that anyone could do or if this was special because he was the president. Viewer Robin Shabelova pointed out that if you are seriously ill, members of the voting committee will show up to your house with a portable voting urn <laughs> and let you toss your vote in. <laughs> I wonder how Zaman felt when they showed up to his bedside with an urn. <laughs> To clarify, this was a bit of Changlish. So the term that the Czechs use is volebni urna, which does translate literally to voting urn. But in English, we just call it a ballot box. A true Czech, she immediately clapped back with, we Czechs would gladly bury our votes. In this video, I did a detailed explainer of why the Czech pre-university school system was confusing to us foreigners and how it seemed so stressful for Czech children because they had to decide on their field of study at a relatively young age, like 14 years old, while American kids are just at that age pursuing their passions and taking courses like underwater basket weaving. At the end of the video, I mentioned that tuition at university in the Czech Republic was free until you turned 26. Well, I was wrong. And it's even better than that. University education is actually free for four years at whatever age you decide to pursue it. The distinction, which was the root of my mistake, is that the government also pays for students' health care while they're enrolled in university up to the age of 26. After that, the government will not pay for your health care. But you could go to school at any age, as long as you are progressively passing your studies, you can get a degree for free. And here's the kicker. You don't even have to be a Czech citizen, as long as you take the courses in the Czech language. So it might take you a couple of decades to learn Czech, uh, but if you don't mind going to school in your golden years, you too can study for free in Czechia. Czechia, land of opportunity. The topic of Trdelnik just never dies, does it? In the Prague Neighborhoods video, we mocked the poor Trdelnik and the neighborhood of Old Town for constantly lying about Trdelnik's origins to tourists. It is, after all, not a traditional Czech pastry but a Hungarian one. Okay, so not from Hungary. As many of you pointed out, the origin of Trdelnik is the town of Skalica in Slovakia. And they've got receipts. Quick English lesson for you Czechs. Receipt, no p, receipt, is what you get when you pay for something. Recipe is a list of ingredients and instructions to cook something. So in American slang, when we say somebody's got receipts, it means that they have proof. So I guess you could say that the town of Skalica's got receipts for the recipe. Specifically, Skalica has the protected geographical indication for Trdelnik, which means that they are the official origin of Trdelnik according to the EU. It's been cooked and enjoyed in this town since the end of the 18th century, with local villagers each putting their individual spin on the recipe. Get it? Spin. But for the record, the origin of Trdelnik is settled. It was created in the town of Skalica, Slovakia, by Josef Vadani, cook, poet, and retired army general of Hungarian citizenship. Moving on. In addition to my fake backgrounds, I also pride myself on my map making abilities. And I seriously let you all down. <sighs> the shame. This geographical error has as much to do with timing as geography. So when Czechoslovakia was formed, it included not only Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia, and Slovakia, but also this region called Transcarpathia or Subcarpathian Ruthenia, which is now part of Ukraine. At the end of World War I, when the victors were drawing up the new maps, they had to divvy up the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so this region was essentially lobbed on to Czechoslovakia, and it remained a part of Czechoslovakia for 18 years. Then, in the second week of March 1939, 
things in Czechoslovakia went quite haywire. On Tuesday, the Slovaks declared independence from Czechoslovakia for the first time and became basically a satellite state, or some say a puppet state of Nazi Germany. Don't at me, I wasn't the one who came up with these terms. Then on Wednesday, the Nazis marched into the Czech lands. That afternoon, the Ruthenians thought, this is our moment, and declared independence from Czechoslovakia. It was not their moment. And Transcarpathian Ruthenia was annexed by Hungary a few hours later. So when Czechoslovakia was formed, the map actually looked more like this. And right before the Velvet Divorce, the map looked like this. Man, you guys are sticklers. I love it. And finally, that brings me to the very greeting I use in every single video. Ahoy vashikni. Ahoy vashikni. Ahoy vashikni. Ahoy vashikni. Ahoy vashikni. I'm not gonna lie, this one hurts. I don't know where I learned ahoy vashikni, but I hear it a lot. I hear it on Czech podcasts. I read it in Czech blogs. But then I started to notice these comments saying that I should be saying Ahoy Vashem instead of Ahoy Vashikni. Libor even said I make his skin crawl when I say Ahoy Vashikni. I'm so sorry, Libor. But I still didn't understand exactly why I should say Ahoy Vashem when I hear Ahoy Vashikni a lot. So I decided to ask my Czech teacher and friend, Alishka, creator of the very informative language learning course, Study Like a Pro. Ahoj, Jen. Díky za skvělý dotaz. Abych byla úplně upřímná, tak jsem si nebyla stoprocentně jistá, která varianta je správná. Takže jsem zavolala do jazykové poradny Ústavu pro jazyk Český Akademie věd České republiky a skonzultovala jsem to s nima a tohle je jejich odpověď. Správné jsou obě varianty, nebo možné jsou obě varianty. Když říkáme v češtině ahoj, tak většinou oslovujeme někoho konkrétního. Ahoj Karle, ahoj Eliško, používáme pátý pád. Pokud použijeme zájmeno všichni, tak použijeme taky pátý pád. Pátý pád zájmena všichni je všichni. Takže ahoj všichni. Ahoj Eliško, ahoj Karle, ahoj všichni. Ale můžeme použít i vlastně tu variantu ahoj všem, protože můžeme říct, posílám ahoj Elišce, třetí pád, posílám ahoj Karlovi, nebo říkám ahoj Karlovi, říkám ahoj všem. A to říkám, vlastně vypustíme a řekneme jenom ahoj všem. Takže možné jsou obě varianty. Tak ahoj všem, ahoj všichni. So there you have it. I'll probably keep using ahoj všichni out of habit, but just to make my greetings less offensive to Libor's ears, I'll try to incorporate Ahoy Vashem into my vocabulary. Please keep the comments coming because the corrections help me get the Czech story straight for all my non-Czech viewers. And if you haven't watched the videos I mentioned today, go check them out and hit the subscribe button so you can catch the mistakes I make in the next one. Uvidíme se příště. Ahoy!